Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, this uh, Innovation Policy Lab online event uh, from the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. Uh, we're here to discuss uh, how COVID-19 is affecting global supply chains. Uh, I'm uh, Murad Hamadi. I'm a reporter at The Logic. Uh, we're about to meet your panelists, but uh, just before we do that, I wanted to point out how you can ask uh, them questions through me. Uh, we're doing this Parliament of Canada style. All questions come through the moderator. Uh, so up on your screens, you'll see uh, you've got a few different options. You can use the Q&A feature of Zoom, uh, tweet with the hashtag Monk Talks, uh, or email them to uh, the lovely folks behind the scenes at events.monk at utoronto.ca, and we'll get to those in a few seconds. But before we do uh, any of that, uh, I want to tell you who uh, you're looking at. So um, uh, uh, I would say from left to right, but I'm not sure how they're showing up in your screens. Uh, their names are there though, which is helpful. So uh, we've got uh, Shauna Braille, who's the director and associate professor uh, at the at Innes College and the associate director of partnership and outreach at the School of Cities at U of T. Um, Dan Resnitz, who's co-director of the Innovation Policy Lab, the Monk Chair of Innovation Studies and a professor at the Monk School. Uh, and then uh, Stephen Denny, who's the postdoctoral, who's a postdoctoral fellow, I should say, uh, in the Innovation Policy Lab uh, at the Monk School. Um, I should also say, for the sake of full disclosure, I am also a UP alum, uh, and so uh, this is a good home turf for me. Um, so um, each of our panelists today have been doing some really interesting work uh, that ties into our topic. Uh, I want to just start by saying, you know, the, the, the title of the slide says uh, Global Supply Chains. I always take these things as, uh, as suggestions uh, and not, uh, not edicts. Uh, so we're gonna be talking about supply chains and value chains, which is might be a different thing, but I think also important. Uh, so I wanted to start by uh, getting uh, all of our folks here to talk a little about the recent work that they've been doing uh, in this area. Uh, some really interesting work starting uh, with Shauna, this piece you wrote for policy options. Um, basically, uh, uh, you know, you framed it to me as how to explain the short-term success of PPE production in Canada right now. Can you tell us a little bit about the work that you've been doing. Sure, thank you. And I think that's exactly right, is that um, I was talking with a colleague and a uh, former co-PhD student, Betsy Donald, who's a professor at Queen's University, and she's the co-author with me on this piece. And we were talking about um, sort of in late March, early April, how it was quite amazing that Canadian manufacturers in some areas in which Canada has some really traditional historic strengths in manufacturing, in automotive, in food and beverage, and in uh, garment manufacturing, how, how factories were able to retool and reorient really rapidly uh, in response to the, pan the COVID pandemic, in response to the lockdowns and the shutdowns and the closing of borders, and in response to the um, really significant need for personal protective equipment or PPE. Um, and it, we, we were connecting with this idea that the economic geography of Canada and our manufacturing history is really key to understanding the pivot from, as we called it, vehicles to ventilators, undergarments to overgarments, and gin to gel. And so that's that's where the genesis of the piece comes from. And that's, um, I think, a really important piece in understanding at least some of Canada's early short-term success in providing uh, enough equipment to keep our healthcare workers and our frontline workers uh, mostly safe and also uh, in having our factories actually in operation right now. Uh, so, so Dan, you've got this forthcoming piece that looks at, um, you know, zooming out from Southern Ontario and Quebec to sort of the, the scope of the continent. Uh, some of the some of the trends uh, in uh, of uh, around offshoring and commercialization, uh, basically trying to answer the question: uh, Why have we found that we can't make some of the things we need? In fact, sure. So again, let me tell you how I got into this. Uh, so a lot of my research was uh, on the new globalization, or what we now call the fragmentation of global production network or chain, and how you in order to have anything you now have in your house, including the computer that you're using to have a Zoom webinar, uh, it goes through probably a few hundred uh, different factories, if not more, if you add all the components, 
in multiple countries. And in each place, they specialize in one stage of production. Uh, as uh, Corona, as it was now then called, started to happen in China, a good friend of mine, uh, George Leopold, who is a, um, a journalist with uh, Electric Engineering Times, called me and said, um, look, this is happening in China, um, and you start to see problems of getting critical electronic equipment and other stuff. Uh, would you mind being interviewed about what do you think will happen? Uh, and back then, nobody thought that uh, Corona would become COVID-19 and would be locked down for eight. So I said, look, short term, if this is solved, I don't see any changes. But if this is not solved, we are in a serious problem because the West, uh, basically anything which is not in the China region, uh, has lost so much production capabilities that we will run out to stoppage of everything that we sort of assume we can find in the supermarket and anything we need. And then it happened. <laughs> it happened very drastically with medical equipment. And Canada is actually relatively doing well. Just look what happened in the United States, for example, and in Europe. Um, but it also, what this crisis did is exposed our significant vulnerabilities. Um, we cannot have a basic telecommunication equipment now um, unless we uh, have global trade. Um, and it also, I think, exposed some of the bad things about this global trade. I don't know if you've seen uh, figures about pollution, but not having tens of thousands of container ship polluting the oceans constantly so we will have disposable plastics uh, for free at the supermarket has probably helped the earth. So I started this um, thinking, what would happen uh, if we take this crisis and make it into opportunity and if this crisis is not solved? Uh, and it turns out that it's very difficult if you want it to be sustained. If you want to be pivoted for a few months, you can, it's difficult. But if your real aim is to make sure you're not vulnerable to the next crisis, so you want to rejig and create, let's call it regional supply chains. Uh, we have lost um, so many capabilities at so many parts of a supply chain uh, that we will need a coordinated collective effort to bring it back because we have to ensure stable demand, not just peak demand. Otherwise, people will not build factories and not get the skills. Um, so that's how this piece came to be. What do we need to do if we want this to happen? Right, and and so we're going to talk about uh, about I think that that regional effect um, uh, significantly uh, in a second. But uh, Stephen, uh, you've been studying uh, also a, a particular set of companies, uh, but less less maybe geographically specific uh, and more sort of uh, uh, size and and industry specific. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mirad, for the introduction, and good morning to uh, our several hundreds of participants who are joining us digitally. Before, the, uh, before this crisis, uh, my team and I at the Innovation Policy Lab, uh, with, in collaboration with some of our partners at the Brookfield Institute, we're doing a pretty detailed uh, study of Canadian scale-up firms, um, identifying who they are, um, where they're located, what their economic impact is, um, and potentially how best to support them. This conversation on scale-ups is a popular one in Canada, um, but it's one that's often quite confused. Confused because we, we often don't know exactly what we're talking about. The definition of what a scale-up is seems to be anything that someone wants to be uh, given attention to. Um, but, we, but we're attempting to bring some rigor to both uh, the conversation on this, uh, how we identify them and how we study them. Uh, these are firms that are, market validated, um, bigger than your startup or early growth firm, and have a disproportionate impact on employment, revenue, uh, productivity, and other relevant measures of sort of economic and, and social impact. 
since the crisis sort of hit, a lot of that work has been put on pause. Uh, part of that's because our partners at Statistic Canada uh, are not actually working from their offices. Um, and for other reasons, it's the pivot to maybe ask some pressing questions. How are scale-ups, as we identify them and know them, responding? And is it any different from other types of firms, from startups and your early growth firms or, or your lifestyle firms? And what we are seeing some of our early work, you know, sort of leveraging our existing networks and data that we have access to is, yes, there, there are big differences in how firms by size or other relevant metrics are responding to uh, the crisis. But the new opportunities they see, the new bottlenecks or challenges, uh, how they're approaching, importantly, payroll. And this is we would contend a very important thing to add to this conversation because you can't all, you can't approach all firms as the same, obviously. Um, I think we saw with the wage subsidy that firms in the technology sector were identified as not being eligible pretty much across the board, from startups to scale-ups. That was something that the Council of Canadian Innovators uh, really pushed on, um, and I think su were successful in getting the, the federal government to amend eligibility requirements for being uh, um, for the ability to access the wage subsidy. Um, so in the grand scheme or within the context of this conversation, probably leaning much more to uh, value chains uh, when we get there. Um, but it's not unrelated to supply chains, and I would like to ask Danny at some point how he thinks that disruptions to global or regional supply chains is going to affect both, you know, uh, startup and scale up ecosystems and the ability to scale a company in Canada. Yeah, and uh, and I think we should uh, we should go right into talking about those regional ecosystems. But I wanted to start by getting uh, Shana to set the set the table a little bit in terms of um, you know uh, starting with this conversation around manufacturing, um, which uh, Dan you were also refer you know talking about our sort of capabilities. Uh, so maybe getting Shana to start to, to set the, the table here in terms of what we're looking at in Canada and particularly in our in our big sort of uh, economic engine provinces uh, and then and then talk about how that feeds in across these uh, these value chains. Sure, thank you. So, um, you know, I started off by talking a little bit about my background as an economic geographer and looking at the you know, why and how we're able to make this pivot by looking at some of the sort of traditional economic geography literature um, and as well as examples from within Canada. And so in Canada, and uh, manufacturing has, has always been concentrated predominantly in two provinces, in Ontario and Quebec. So 62% of the population currently lives in those two provinces alone, but nearly three quarters, 72% of all manufacturing employment is located in those two provinces. And it's, in, it's concentrated um, mostly in the sort of, in the larger urban centers and regions in Toronto and Montreal. Um, over the last several decades, as, as Danny alludes to, there's been, um, you know, a lot of, there's been job loss, but there's also been the loss of, of skill and the loss of ability to supply mm -hmm. uh, goods from within our own country, um, mm -hmm. partly because of offshoring, because of jobs moving to lower cost locations to take advantage of lower wage labor, but also to, to be able to benefit from uh, lower transportation costs to move those goods back. Uh, and also as a result of automation and upskilling in the kinds of jobs, in the kinds of manufacturing jobs um, that we desire to have in Canada. So moving from the lower skill, lower wage jobs to the higher skill, higher wage jobs. And in some respects, we've done that successfully, but not without very significant job loss. Um, something like a quarter of a million uh, manufacturing jobs lost across the country. Um, you know, in the in the early 2000s, and then another several hundred thousand jobs lost uh, following the 2008-2009 period of recession. We started to see a little bit of growth in manufacturing employment in some of the bigger city regions, like in Toronto, um, for instance. And the, and we've also seen jobs added in other sectors. So while Toronto lost 130,000 manufacturing jobs in the decade between 2006 and 2016, at the same time, they gained around 50,000 jobs in financial services. Um, 
And so there are, there are trade-offs here, but what we're starting to see is that if we give up all of the opportunity to have both the skill and the manufacturing ability and the ability to source from different uh, places across the country, because of course Canada is also uh, a country with both natural resources um, that can be you know, the primary inputs to the production of goods, um, as well as an agricultural economy, right? And so we see the, you know, some of the surplus of grain production in the prairies, for instance, um, which in the sort of initial stages of, let's say, the flour shortages in the grocery stores, it wasn't so much a, um, a, a problem that we didn't have the right products, but we didn't have them packaged in the right way. They were being packaged and sold to commercial uh, users, and as commercial use declined, um, and and personal use increased there, you know, can we move to the way in which we're packaging these goods? And so interestingly, I was at the grocery store last week and there was almost no flour on the shelf except for one brand called uh, Prairie Flour, which I'd never seen. Uh, and I purchased it. And when I looked it up, I saw they're a commercial producer and they clearly were able to figure out how to source the right kinds of packaging in order to be able to sell directly to the to the grocery store and to the to the consumers. But these are the kinds of challenges we face. They're they're complex. Um, and we have, you know, within the, the cities where we have some both small and larger um, factories and manufacturers that are able to make this pivot, we also see some job increases and, and hiring, right? So in some of the, you know, the garment workers uh, in places that are making masks and gowns are hiring hundreds of workers. Um, but those workers are now essentially frontline workers. They have to travel uh, sometimes on public transit, sometimes long distances to get to their jobs. We need to figure out how to make sure that they're safe, how to make sure that they're well uh, compensated. Um, and again, I think also um, this point was made really well is that this is a short term uh, move, but to think about the longer term impact uh, and approach for how we might actually repatriate some more manufacturing jobs and move away from some of the very significant offshoring so that we have the ability to respond uh, better and differently in, you know, in, in these kinds of anticipated and yet somewhat unanticipated crises that will put us at, at a better advantage globally. I, I think that's, uh, that's Danny's cue. Uh, uh, his, his bat signal has gone up now. <laughs> so um, I agree. So there's two issues, and I'll actually refer to both Stephen and Sean. So Stephen, if indeed uh, we have uh, an abruptness, uh, either this crisis or, by the way, the next crisis, which is just around the corner with climate change, political turmoil, security issues, nuclear uh, reactors go kaput in Japan, we just should assume that every five years from now, there will be a crisis. Um, that should be under the benchmark for what we do and how we plan from now on. Um, most or many of the startup and scale ups that you see in Canada, unless they are pure software, will be in significant disadvantage. Because right now, the model is that as soon as I finish designing something, sometimes not even fully designing it, I ship it to the China region, um, mostly to Taiwan and China, a little bit of Korea, and they make it happen. And then we ship it back or not, depending on who we want to uh, buy it. Uh, if we can't do that, um, right now, um, it is questionable whether we can have a final product. And uh, this is true for commercial products and also for not commercial products, but the not commercial products, especially if you're not Canada in the US, you do have some semiconductor fabrication facilities. In Canada, this is a big problem and we should be very much aware of it because it's not just an ICT. Um, in terms of what Shona said, um, here is my issue with some of the things we do. We force all those Canadians um, to move, um, to change their jobs, 
those companies that want to help hire. And then six weeks from now, it's over. And immediately all the hospitals and all the Loblaws and everyone else said, oh, thank you so much. But now we're going back to the cheapest provider from China. And not only you have to fire all those people, uh, but you're going to lose all your investment in capital equipment. What do you think will happen in the next crisis in five years? Those companies will not be there. Especially for SMEs, they will say, we cannot afford And indeed, there is that example. There's one producer of masks, of N95 masks, left in the United States, and he refuses to pull up his production in the beginning because he said, I did it last time with the last scare, and then immediately when the scare was over, all the hospitals stopped buying from me and went back to China. And I had to fire all those people, each and every one. I don't want to repeat, and I don't believe in your peak in demand, and I don't believe you that I will have stable demand. Uh, and I think that's where we should have collective uh, um, government policy, both on the provincial level and in the federal level. And this is not just for medical, this is for food, this is for anything that we manufacture. And it will also create a lot of jobs which are not only for R&D engineers. And I have to tell you, most Canadians don't want to be R&D engineers and wouldn't be feel fulfilled in being R&D engineers and they also have jobs in their taxpayers. And I'll stop here. So Stephen, uh, I want to get you in on this, but I want to I want to frame this uh, slightly differently, which is to ask as you talk to these as you talk to these companies, uh, I'm interested to know how much you know you, you were re uh, referencing the the issue that scale ups, uh, SaaS companies in particular were having getting in on the wage subsidy, right? This has been a uh, an issue that uh, I've been hearing a lot about in my coverage. Uh, I'm interested in how much these companies are approaching. Uh, in your experience, approaching this moment in the way that Dan is uh, referring to as a, as a moment of crisis that will be repeated versus how much they're treating this as a one-off and how much you think, uh, you know, how, how much of the, the this is a, a sort of a, a black swan event to them? So it's, it's a big question. I'm not sure I can give a definitive answer but if pressed, I would say black swan. I, I do not think that there is the preparation infrastructure otherwise to deal with regular continuous crises that occur at shorter intervals, as I think Danny was sort of kind of framing the conversation. So in the technology sector, you know, they are uh, better insulated from the shock, the external shock of a shutdown, of a pandemic. Um, and so the, the focus of a lot of our work, which tends to be in the technology industry, not exclusively, but tends to focus on that, um, may be pushing us to have a conversation that's not as broad in scope. The breadth is much less. Uh, and that is, in some ways, a function of this shift that Shauna mentioned before, where if you look at the employment in the ICT manufacturing cluster in Toronto, it's been decreasing steadily since 2001. But if you look at the ICT services, where you're going to find a lot of your SaaS companies, it's been increasing, um, and especially so since 2006. So there was this ecosystem that was uh, very much under construction, coming to fruition and, and maturation, um, that is most certainly under pressure. Um, but it's, it's hard to see that the software company SaaS or, or similar firms are approaching this in a way that they need to fundamentally restructure the way their business model. I don't think they're there yet. You think a lot of these firms were very easily moved to entirely online. Um, and you think about global supply chains for software firms, it were, I mean, the supply that they primarily rely on is talent. Um, a lot of the firms who I have interact with much more intimately had a more or less seamless transition. There are concerns over uh, online security, um, 
of course, accounts receivable is, is, and, and revenue is their top concern. But other than that, it was a pretty seamless transition. So, so to me, I, I wonder whether this event will uh, shift the focus of people like us to focus perhaps less on what we think is the core part of Canada's so-called innovation agenda, which is technology firms, because technology firms, of course, aren't the only firms who innovate. Um, that it would be a misperception, of course. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's how we see it. Um, so uh, I want I wanted to turn to the, the sort of uh, the prescriptive uh, bit of this now because I think uh, I think there's a, a lot of value there. Um, starting uh, starting maybe with, with Danny about the uh, and and Shona, you'd also mentioned this need for um, you know a sort of reserve uh, amount of production or reserve capacity. Um, how do we balance this? Um, you know if uh, uh, if, if as you as you said at the top, we've got these supply chains that are like highly specialized factories and uh, spread across the world, uh, how realistic is it to recreate some of that uh, within Canada, or does it have to be province by province? I mean, you know, uh, Vancouver is as far away from uh, the East Coast as uh, as I don't know Florida is. So uh, let me start. Um, I think that it will be unrealistic to assume that we're going to roll globalization back, nor do we want to, to be very clear. Uh, we have uh, elevated more millions of people out of poverty thanks to globalization, and we should not forget that. Uh, however, what we should assume, or what we should uh, at least hope for, is enough capacities that we are less vulnerable and that we can do those spikes if need to and that we have a minimal level of vulnerability to the next crisis and in order to do that i would like to see more regional reshoring um, if we had a working north america which we don't uh, we could have done something together with mexico and the united states which will make sense but we just don't have it we don't know how the rest of North America will behave even next week. Um, so we can't count on it. What we can count is on creating enough stable. Remember, if you want reshoring, if you want people to start to invest in manufacturing and production, they need to be have stable demand. And the way that you can create a lot of stable demand is first by government procurement, uh, both direct and indirect. So if you buy something and you get reimbursed, like Medicaid in the United States or drugs in Canada, you can say uh, either you have to have an X percentage of that, including active ingredients made in Canada or North America, depending on what uh, agreements Canada is now signed on, um, and you will be either reimbursed more or you will not be allowed to sell if you don't produce a certain percentage. The second is you can have, start to have regulation laws that will give full disclosure. And we have seen that working very well in food, for example, fair trade, organic, local, and also in terms of quality and branding. Um, you buy much more expensive machinery and cars and things for your house because it says it's made in Germany. Um, so we can do that. Uh, we can also start to pool resources. So a lot of the electronics, uh, many of those factories that uh, Stevens companies and scale-ups need don't produce for one company, they produce for hundreds of companies. So with matching funds, we can create, uh, create what we should call uh, shared production assets that can produce and can quickly move between line of production for many uh, Canadian companies. Um, so there is a lot of things that you can do if you decide to do that, including, by the way, uh, regulating um, some of those production, critical production, just like you regulate banks you need to have higher inventory and you need to submit every year plans for what are you going to do in a global crisis that show that you can produce in Canada 
a minimal amount of stuff. Um, so I will now give it to Shona to uh, give her pearls of wisdom on that subject. So, well, I don't disagree with anything you've said, Danny. And um, uh, several years ago, I, I did some work looking at uh, talent attraction and retention in the fashion industry and, and Canada uh, and Canadian cities, including Toronto and continuing to be Montreal, were, uh, were global leaders in garment manufacturing uh, for many decades um, and until sort of the, until the emergence of fast fashion, until the ability to work overseas with much lower wage producers uh, and, and, um, and sewers. Um, and today, Montreal is still one of, it's the second or third largest garment manufacturing center in North America. Uh, I think it's the second behind Los Angeles, but it again has lost much of its manufacturing capability. When we looked at Toronto, what we found was that the, uh, the designers and the, the manufacturing that remained was very much niche and small scale. Um, and so it was focused on things like building the brand and the design, which Danny has alluded to as being those, those are the things where you build the, the value piece. Um, the, the highest sort of asset of these firms is the talent, is the people and the designers, like Stephen said, who walk in and out the door every, every day and you need those people in order to have uh, the value of your company. And yet, you know, when we looked at the Toronto uh, cluster in terms of fashion design in particular, what we found was that at the government level, it was considered either a lifestyle industry. So those who were succeeding had very small firms uh, where they were mostly supporting their family and a couple of other families, uh, or it was considered a sunset industry, an industry that would, would no longer be prominent uh, in, in Canada. Can, can we get back to the sort of the heyday of, of, of manufacturing in, in garments and in apparel, uh, in automotive? Uh, you know, these are very different industries with very different, you know, some of the similar kinds of pressures around the offshoring, looking for lower wage production, new specialization emerging regionally, the sourcing of uh, components from, you know, many, if not dozens, or even a hundred countries in the case of producing maybe um, a vehicle. Um, it will be really challenging to get back to not just the small scale niche producers and even scaling some of them up but actually to large scale, wide scale production. And so I agree, uh, it, it requires investment and, um, and policy attention from all levels of government. Um, it requires thinking about the educational piece really carefully around how do we train uh, these workers. So in places where the very last uh, you know, producer or manufacturer of a particular kind of good closes down, you lose the talent, you lose the skill set to be able to produce that. You have to build it up again. Um, it makes it makes sense in, a, in an environment in which there's, you know, easy access to goods from global, you know, from so sourced globally, it makes sense to specialize. Um, and one of the points that we make in the policy options piece is that where Canada has succeeded is in its general diversity. But how do you promote that sort of overarching diversity and how do you plan, regardless of how, how much you sort of are aware of the, the risk of these kinds of, you know, once a generation events happening every five years or every year or whatever it might be, um, how do you plan and how do you make sure you have what you need to address that particular crisis or challenge? And, and it's, it's a real challenge and it can't be done uh, without government investment and without government support, in addition to the need for these sort of associational actors to come together to collaborate amongst a you know a competitive environment. Please, not every year. I my sleep cycle can't take it. Uh, uh, Stephen, can we talk about uh, skills here? Uh, I want to talk about talent retention and and uh, and also talent availability because. Um, Obviously, that's a, such an important piece of this, but um, but you've been doing some interesting work on the level of talent uh, that there's a gap in for sort of the innovation economy right now. Yeah, it's uh, it's going to be a tough question. I want to answer this, and then I want to tie this back into what I think is an emerging theme in this conversation about a shift in the way the government approaches industry. Let me get to that in a second. Um, 
so a couple things on talent, and uh, I think I can tie this into, I see a question that we have hanging out there about uh, labor policy as it's related to immigration. Uh, this will be relevant to that. That's from Rachel, thank you. The, uh, with regards to the ability to, sus to sustain scale, to scale up a firm and to remain at the position of a scale up requires a, a level of talent that often isn't available in Canada. Um, it requires international attraction, i.e. immigration. Um, in addition to, in order to keep it as domestic as possible, um, experience. So what we've learned is that there is, uh, there's a major bottleneck for firms, especially in technology, but, uh, but across industries, um, in recruiting and maintaining high level sales and marketing. Um, and how this is going to impact that uh, and the fluid situation that we find ourselves in is a tough question that I don't think I can really answer. Um, but before the crisis, talent was a bottleneck. Um, and it's unclear how, given the disruptions that COVID-19 has caused to uh, migration, global travel, the type of impact that that's going to have on the emerging technology and other types of clusters and our ecosystems across major Canadian city regions. Um, I, I am uh, I'm not bullish, um, but I, I, will, I will stop myself from speculating there. Um, in terms of immigration policy, that's going to be, I think, a careful political conversation. Um, there's probably going to be demand to uh, compensate or really support uh, Canadian and, per and permanent residents of Canada and um, our boom back to normal whenever that may begin. Uh, but that'll have to be balanced with the needs of industry um, and immigration. And we know that that's a delicate uh, tap dance at times. If I can take this back to uh, still on government policy, but something that was definitely emerging from what Shauna and Danny were talking about is about a new sort of role for the Canadian government. There's a lot of questions in our box here about Canadian industrial policy. Um, and I think the, uh, at least if you're coming at this from a technology perspective, Canada is, is considered a, an open trading country without an industrial policy. And the calls you see for greater government involvement in the realm of procurement, uh, as, as Danny said, in order to create stable demand across the supply chain, but also in order to support and encourage innovation and, the, and scaling. It would require a completely, I think, re-envisioned role for the Canadian government in the economy and in the industry, especially with the, in the realm of industrial policy. And we see some, some evidence that they're at least thinking along those lines um, in the changes that were made to how one can use IRAP, which is you know, support for industrial uh, research. It is the most commonly used form of direct intervention that the federal government uses in order to, to support uh, in order to support research at the firm level. And the, the question I have uh, for myself and for the, the panelists as well is what, I mean, what is, what role does that need to play? I mean, we're talking about, uh, I know Danny's, he's, he's, he's talked about um, in the media and elsewhere about near shoring, uh, about addressing problems of supply chain disruption. Uh, Sean is talking about the, you know, she's talking a lot about these small, these SMEs um, in retail who provide innovative activities, who employ people. I just wonder how are those firms going to be protected? How are those firms going to be otherwise supported? Because I have a, a, a hypothesis that absent any significant changes, that there's going to be a glut of acquisitions of otherwise promising Canadian technology firms and elsewhere um, that don't currently have the support and frankly didn't really have the support to begin with. Because the conversation that I see taking place at both the firm level and in sort of the ecosystem writ large with regards to researchers, um, uh, industry specialists, are the same things that we were talking about before. I think the severity of the conversation is much more apparent now, uh, given the challenges that the crisis has faced. But um, what is the new role for government procurement to create stable uh, uh, demand? Um, how will the Canadian government, I, I don't know, just uh, delicately, because it is a delicate process, at the same time you want to maintain uh, an economy open to foreign direct investment, but at the same time, you should provide supports for scaling domestic companies. And this is sort of the entry point of the project that we're running. Um, 
is the problem of scaling in Canada, given its position as an open trading nation with, uh, with not much of an industrial policy outside of extractive industries. And I just want to jump in and, and add a question from Paul there to, to this mix, because I think it's relevant, which is, um, you know, the, the, the conversation around uh, regionalizing industrial policy with subsidies or, or you know, uh, or regulation, uh, how, how do we do this while, while uh, meeting our international obligations and under WTO rules? So, uh, I, I, but I do want to hear uh, you answer Stephen's question, which is, the, you know, what, what do we do on the, on the protection side? How do we balance this with, with our obligations? So uh, first, let me just jump in and say that the countries we like to emulate are actually already doing it. Um, forget Japan or what we would call like outliers. Germany, part of the EU, all the agreements that we are signed, has now, during this crisis, the government raised a very large fund and a few other um, regulatory tools to prevent exactly that. The buying of SMEs on cheap prices after the crisis. And it is now, while they love FDI, it is much more difficult for Chinese or American or Saudis to go and buy and grab cheap manufacturing and non-manufacturing German companies when this crisis is over, okay? And I think that is completely legal under the WTO and the EU and all the other trade agreements. And it is something that Canada needs to think about. Otherwise, uh, we will have a lot of uh, branch plants here that used to be. And they will pick the most successful or at least the most promising company. They will not pick the laggers. So the taxpayers will continue to pay for the laggers while the best companies are now for it. And we need to think about it. Second, um, we do it like many other, other countries do it, with a little bit of chutzpah and a little bit of shelf insurance. Um, China is the one country that has managed to have thriving internet, global internet companies. And interestingly, it's the only one that, for security and cultural reason, prevented the Americans, Googles, Facebooks, Amazon, and all the rest uh, to get dominance in China. Um, we also can use culturals. Uh, we can also use a lot of it. And I think that after this crisis, it is very logical and rational to say that for security reasons. Um, food supply is a security issue. Medical supply is a security issue. Um, continuing to have education, it's telecommunication. It's also pivotal and critical security issues. I would also going um, to say that uh, we can just imitate other countries um, and be Canada because I don't think any of the big powerful countries are going to really oblige by the gentleman and WTO agreement they obliged before when they're going, if they decided to restructure at least some of their production networks. Um, so we can just follow their lead and be, be shy about it. The, the part where I would like to weigh in is, a, is on the regulation piece. Um, some of the many the panelists know that I've been doing work um, looking at the emergence of ride hailing and in disruptive industries and the regulation of ride hailing across Canada and municipalities, where for the most part it's a municipal um, a municipal issue. And actually, one of the big learnings from this work is that governments at first said, well, this is innovation, it's disruption, it doesn't fit within our existing guidelines, we're going to regulate differently and we're going to regulate more lightly. And as a result of the sort of rollout of both the, the acceptance of, of ride hailing activities, but also 
the behavior and the act, the behavior that's induced as a result of the emergence and widespread adoption of ride hailing, what, gov what municipal governments and in the US state governments and in some cases provincial and national governments are learning is that they need to change their, um, their, their approach and they need to have to move from regulating differently and lightly to regulating differently and more stringently. Um, and so I think we, we're seeing, we're going to see the same thing here when we look at, you know, what does the future mean and what does the future bring and how do we continue to support um, Canadian firms and Canadians and, and in, in terms of being able to respond and survive and thrive um, in the face of, of all kinds of unknown challenges and crises. And so what that means is we need, we need governments more than ever. There's a lot of discussion about, you know, all of the sudden coronavirus has become the era of big government once again, when there was a lot of kind of retraction. I think at the, again, at the municipal and at the regional level, we want to look really carefully at incentives in terms of trying to attract and retain firms. Uh, there's a lot of interesting debates going on uh, and also a lot of uh, sort of research that shows that incentives to attract large uh, global international producers um, don't actually provide the economic benefit. Uh, they don't pay off in the end. And so we need to think about as we're starting to see some of our Canadian firms really struggle at the local level and particularly at the local retail level, uh, especially in food and also in some cases um, in just all kinds of small scale neighborhood uh, retail activity. If what we don't want to see is, a, is an environment in which it's all big box, large retail, multinationals, then we do have to think about how do we support the growth of local and the growth of Canadian in new ways and in ways that are very much reflective of what we've learned as a result of coronavirus, as a result of climate change, um, and as a result of this sort of thinking towards what does the future hold. And I think, uh, Dan, you wanted to point out something about financialization and regulations here. Yes, I, I think all of what we talked about is correct and true. But what we have not talked about is why we ended up there in this extreme globalization. So what are the push factors? And there's a lot of regulation that are either direct or indirect subsidies uh, and incentives to manager and investors to offshore. Um, from various financial metrics, like returns on assets. So the first thing that I would do if I'm a manager is make sure I don't have assets on the balance sheet. How do I don't have assets on the balance sheet? I offshore all my production or outsource it. I create an agreement in which 90% or 60% of that factory Really, production belongs to me, but it's not my factory. It is belong to Walmart or Fox or, or whatever. And that immediately moves my return on assets to look so good. Um, we have other issues with shareholder values, uh, demands for stock buybacks and all the rest uh, that incentivize managers and financiers and investors to focus their innovation on financial engineering and short-term manipulation of a stock price. And for a very good reason. And the good reason is not only it is both positive carrots and sticks, they will earn millions of dollars. That, and they will lose their jobs in weeks if they don't. So it's not rational to argue against, uh, those CEOs and CEOs and said, oh, you evil. Well, Canadian. The first, and if it's going to be only one CEO of a public company that will start to behave differently, will find himself without the job very quickly. So we need to change those regulations. Then there are other regulations, and I will now talk about the US and, and drug manufacturing, the FDA. If you build a factory, a pharmaceutical factory in the United States, it will be subject to unannounced um, visits, regulatory visits from the FDA, which are the way it should be. 
However, if you put the exact same factory in China or India, all those visits by the FDA will be announced. So you can prepare for that. So guess where you are incentivized to put your factory. And there are multiple of those kinds of regulatory behavior, which for years we have been doing, um, which if I was a rational CEO of a big Canadian company, I would say, you want me to, I mean, you stuck everything against me financially, managerial incentives and regulatory incentives for me to do anything in Canada. You want to change it? I need fi different financial metrics. I need different legal people. So the hedge funds and active investors will not sue me if I don't offshore. And I want uh, the same regulatory treatment if I do it in China and I do it in Canada. Right. Um, I want to try and uh, combine uh, two questions here that we've had from uh, our wonderful audience. Uh, one from a, a name uh, some of you uh, will be familiar with. I certainly am, Graham Moffat, uh, who asks, um, you know, German and Japanese companies have managed to occupy a wide range of places in manufacturing value chains and have maintained robust communities of engineering practice. Is it feasible for us to try and build and expand on Ontario's still very strong manufacturing base uh, to uh, augment our capacity? Uh, and then I wanna uh, combine uh, another question because I think it kind of feeds in here from David Picol, which is what sectors would you uh, prioritize for reshoring and shortening supply chains? Uh, so on the one hand, you know, building on our existing manufacturing capacity to build something like uh, uh, the German and Japanese economies have, and on the other hand, uh, across the economy, what sectors uh, yeah, should we be focusing on? I'll, any callers? I just have a, hi, Grant. The, uh, I think we're talking about reversing like decades of historical trends. Um, Germany being the poster child of a coordinated market economy and Canada and the United States being those of a, a liberal market economy. Not exactly sure institutionally or otherwise uh, how we would man, how, would, how that would be managed, especially on the manufacturing base front. I was terribly uh, pessimistic and not super informative, I realize, but uh, that's all I have to say on that question. Pessimistic and not super informative is my life philosophy. Uh, Shauna, you were uh, about to jump in there. Yes, well, I was going to respond to David Tickle's question, which of course is a good, tough question. And um, if anybody has a, a crystal ball right now, uh, it's the time to, to get it out and get it to, to work properly. I think going back to the notion that we already across Canada have strengths, have a history in a diverse sort of uh, number of industries, including industries that are really, really relevant right now in terms of responding to COVID, both being you know, auto manufacturing and advanced manufacturing, uh, garment manufacturing, and food and beverage. Um, and these are all things, you know, that are producing, whether it's the meta. And the other thing I would add was, would be on um, medicine um, and medical equipment, so, so pharmaceuticals in particular. Um, the challenge is, you know, it's easy to say, well, these are the four that right now we, are, we know we could do more, we could do things differently. And if we did, we would be in a really, at a really significant advantage. Um, the challenge is, again, it's hard, it's hard to know what the next crisis looks like. Can you prepare for every crisis? I mean, certainly that's what emergency planning is about. Um, somebody noted that in a lot of the different, you know, in the last several years, a number of cities have built these resilience plans. And yet most of those resilience plans uh, didn't account for a, a global health, public health pandemic. They accounted for things like uh, climate change and, and flooding. Um, destruction of infrastructure through terrorism. 
um, you know, huge, massive recession. So we understand some of some how to address some of those challenges. The key is how do we shore up and sort of reshore, reorient our the industries that'll be needed both this time and in the future. Part of the answer is is diversity of industries and diversity of skills. Um, but then, you know, there are there are there are weaknesses in that approach too. Can you do everything well? Probably not. Um, yeah, for sure. I, and, 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 you know, the foresight is the, uh, is the big, uh, the big problem of, uh, of, well, look, knowing what's coming around the corner is the problem of all policy making, right? Uh, but, uh, Danny, uh, did you want to weigh in here? Yeah, uh, first I want to say, uh, and, and, and also talk with both Stephen and, and Shauna, but the one thing that we have to remember is also how you profit from technology in global globalized world and what we can do about it. Uh, and in this case, one of the things that Canada has always been very good at is coming up with the first few inventions and then no bothering to innovate around it. Uh, I think, and, and the stories we heard about patents, you know, are long and I'm not going to repeat that, but there's so many technologies that other companies not connect are making billions off, uh, employing a lot of people in very good jobs around the world, not Canadian. So one thing we can do is actually try to solve this issue now, because now it is okay to actually demand the Canadian inventors and Canadian companies, and by the way, foreign companies. Israel demanded from foreign subsidies if they want to operate in Israel. Uh, and we have a regulatory international regulatory framework for doing that with what's called BEPS. Um, if you do the R&D, you get the IP assigned in the place you do the R&D. And because you now have to pay taxes on it, according to various uh, trade agreements, uh, OECD agreements, you then should also do the production because you already are paying taxes. So you might as well do production. And we are now helping so many companies. One of the demands that, or two of the demands that we can give them is, if you do R&D, you need to have the IP registered in Canada, and you have to do production in Canada. And if we gave you money for production in Canada, you have to ensure that you keep it for an X amount of years. Um, you do it enough, I'm sure there'll be some companies that will find a way to get off it, but there'll be enough that because they have to do it, we'll figure out how, how to profit by doing it. And with all due respect to all of us in this virtual room and to all government officials, the people who really know how to make profit in business are usually in business. Uh, and that also goes to David's question. I think that we should do it in each and every industry that we can rationally defend uh, doing that according to various security, cultural, health agreement, and not run into too many problems with our trade partners. And we should also hang on on the sophisticated strengths we have. So in auto and manufacturing, I wouldn't necessarily go to auto assembly but I will go to material science, where we now, in Canada, uh, create the latest steels that all car manufacturing wants to have. We have a people that actually put them, and they don't even bother to produce them. They first of all create them on a computer, get approval for them, and then produce them. So I will hang down on all of those where I see a potential for growth over the next five or 10 years, knowing there'll be 50, 60, 70% failure. But knowing that I don't do that, the only thing I make sure is that we have a 100% failure. Uh, well, on, on, uh, on that cherry note, uh, 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 you know, we've run through our time. Uh, there's several excellent questions that I apologize we didn't get, uh, uh, I didn't get to ask. Uh, some about uh, the effect of the U.S., some about our cost structure, some about the food supply chain. Uh, if you want to email me offline, I have lots of things to say about lentils in Saskatchewan. 
Um, but uh, I'm afraid uh, that's all the time uh, we have today. Thank you so much for uh, attending. Um, thank you so much uh, to our uh, wonderful panelists. Um, you uh, can, uh, I'm sure if you keep tweeting uh, at the hashtag we put up before, uh, some of us at least will be looking through that. Uh, so uh, thank you so much to uh, Shauna Braille, uh, the Director and Associate Professor at Dennis College and Associate Director of Partnerships and Outreach at the School of Cities, to Dan Bresnitz, uh, the Co-Director of the Innovation Policy Lab, uh, the Monk Chair of Innovation Studies and a Professor at the Monk School, and uh, to Stephen Denny, a postdoctoral fellow in the Innovation Policy Lab at the Monk School. I have been, and I guess continue to be Murad Hamadi, a reporter at The Logic. Uh, thank you so much. That's it from us. Thank you.